governmental function in that it creates an excuse for the regulators who fail to exercise their power the first time around. The Act also creates the opportunity to flesh out the 2300 pages through granting the administrator's vast discretion, which will be discussed today. Um, we will also discuss the provisions of the Act which allow the FDIC to take over companies and the judicial review. To discuss these several issues, we have, commencing on my right, uh, C. Boyden Gray of the District of Columbia, the former ambassador to the European Union and former special envoy for Eurasian uh, energy diplomacy. He served in the former spe as former special envoy for European Union Affairs and as a White House counsel for the administration of President George H.W. Bush from 1989 to 1993. Mr. Gray was a partner for many years in the Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door firm in Washington and now heads his own firm. He, following his graduation from university, he served in the U.S. Marine Corps and after law school he clerked for Earl Warren, the Chief Justice from 1968 to 1969. To his left uh, is uh, Professor Ronald Levin, who is the Henry Hitchhoff Professor of Washington University in St. Louis. He was the 2000-2001 Chair of the Section of Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice of the American Bar Association. Professor Levin served from 2007 to 2010 as the AB advisor to the Drafting Commission to revise a Model State Administrative Procedure Act. He's also served from 2002 to 2005 as a member of the ABA Standing Committee on Amicus Curia Briefs and as a reporter on Judicial Review for the ABA. He has uh, written extensively in the field of administrative law. To my left, um, only geographically, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, Peter J. Wallison, uh, who holds the Arthur F. Burns Chair in Financial Policy Studies and is co-director of the AIE's Program on Financial Policy Studies. Before joining AEI, he practiced banking, corporate, and financial law at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in Washington, D.C., and New York. Mr. Wallison has held a number of government positions from 1981 to 1985. He was general counsel of the U.S. Treasury Department, and during 1986 and 87, Mr. Wallison served as White House counsel to President Ronald Reagan. He's also the author of the book, Ronald Reagan, The Power of Conviction and the Success of His Presidency, published in December 2002 and available on Amazon.com. Um, to his left is uh, Professor Art Wilmarth, who is a professor of law at the George Washington University Law School here in Washington, D.C. He joined the law school's faculty in 1986 after 11 years in private practice, where he was a partner in the D.C. office of the Jones Day Law Firm. Professor Wilmarth is the author of numerous law review articles and book chapters dealing with banking law and constitutional history. And he is a co-author of a book on corporate law. In 2005, the American College of Consumer Financial Services Lawyers awarded him its prize for the best law review article published in the field of consumer financial services law during 2004. The format of today's presentation will be that we will go from right to left. Uh, the speakers will speak about 10 minutes on the subjects of their choice. And then we will open up the panel to ask questions of each other. Maybe I'll ask a question or two, and then we'll turn over the questioning to the members of the public. So without further ado, Mr. Borden Gray. <coughs> we, just, uh, we, we decided on this side to, to do this seated. This doesn't prejudge what you may do <laughs> on your <laughs> side, but we're going we're gonna to do this seated. We're, um, now, Ron and I have been friends for a long time. We're, we're going to disagree, but I couldn't find, I have a better person to disagree with than, than Ron, so uh, we're going to start out by agreeing on the seating. Um, when I was in Europe, I worried that, um, that if we didn't watch out in this country, the, the aggressive 
uh, rulemaking coming out of Brussels would uh, drown the rulemaking here because of international, you know, the, the, the international nature of, uh, of our global economy. And I used to warn the D.C. Circuit judges that, you know, in five years uh, they might not have a job. Now, I was reminded of this uh, this summer by, by the former chief judge who said, Boyden, uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I've got a job for the rest of my life, um, uh, meaning referring to the health care and financial uh, regulations that are going to be coming down the pike that Judge Bea referred to. Um, presumably he'll get his share of this. There's more than enough to go around for every uh, circuit. The, the one word I think that, that, that characterizes uh, this legislation has legal significance is vagueness. It is incredibly vague, uncertain. This is what Greenspan remarked. We point this out in uh, the paper, which, by the way, uh, is available to everybody, so I'm not going to go into great detail about it. Um, and vagueness tends to connote, and when you think in constitutional terms, of the non-delegation doctrine, uh, which um, is the, the first uh, sort of principle that comes to mind. But it is true that non-delegation hasn't been formally invoked since the Schechter case. In, in the 30s, and what the court has done uh, since then is um, use a, a doctrine of constitutional avoidance uh, at times to narrow statutes in a way to avoid uh, the issue. Um, the opinion in American Trucking, one of the most recent cases, points out that maybe delegation problems will rise in, 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 in level of concern, the broader the, 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 the scope of the economy that's covered. Now, I'm not sure that's even here enough to overcome um, the reluctance on the part of the court to actually knock a statute out on this ground. Um, however, um, I do think there are other grounds that, that, that are inescapable that, that could cause uh, a court to, and the Supreme Court, to take a very careful uh, look. We, we go over three titles that all are related both by subject matter and by, by potential legal infirmity. And uh, they, they don't all share exactly the same judicial review provisions, for example. Section 202 of the, of the Resolution Authority is, is, is pro probably the most, the most questionable and, and, and unique. Uh, but they all share more or less the same principles that I'm going to run over very, very quickly. Um, one of the problems here is that uh, whereas in a typical non-delegation case we have a very vague grant of authority, uh, the courts are there and able to uh, to construe the statute in a way that might avoid it. And this is done um, uh, frequently, as I said. It, it was done actually in American trucking. But in this case, uh, the court's ability to issue uh, interpretations of the law is dramatically curtailed. Uh, some, in some cases, uh, under the law, especially 202, courts are ousted of jurisdiction altogether for any issue. Um, and others, they're limited to arbitrary and capricious review, which, and Ron's the expert here, but to me that says the usual Chevron arguments about statutory interpretation may be off limits. You may be limited to a state farm type of review. Does the, does the opinion have any internal logic? Um, but but you, can't, you can't link it to what the statute uh, might mean. Um, uh, in addition, um, uh, uh, I mean, for example, the Arbitrary and capricious review is runs through all all of the uh, provisions. Um, uh, in the Title II Resolution Authority, it goes beyond that and uh, says the courts have to deal with this, or the district court does, in 24 hours, and it has to do so in secret if if the uh, received seized entity uh, doesn't uh, submit uh, voluntarily to it. And there are even uh, criminal penalties for disclosing what might be happening behind closed doors. Uh, maybe that's a violation of the First Amendment. I don't know. The penalties run against the leaker, not the leak, the leak, the leak or not the leaky. But uh, it's it's, and I haven't studied that aspect of it. But uh, that raises certain uh, uh, questions. Uh, uh, the seizure standard says, does the bank? pose a, a risk of failure, and then, secondly, does that failure pose a risk to the financial stability of the United States? The second finding seems to be to be the key one, but that is off limits for the courts under, under Section 202, under the second uh, uh, title. Um, so the courts are, are, are maybe not completely stripped, but are severely compromised in their ability to construe statutes, these statutes, these provisions narrowly. And then to add to that, the Congress is, is, is kind of, uh, of uh, cut out, especially with the Consumer uh, Bureau, uh, the Title X, uh, 
because the funding comes from the Fed and the appropriations committees are purportedly uh, prohibited from exercising oversight review. Now, I, don't, I can't see a sergeant at arms storming into the appropriations committee to shut down the hearing if someone raises uh, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, but, and I don't know how one Congress necessarily can bind an, another one, but there it is. Uh, that certainly is the, is the intent. Uh, under American trucking, of course, agencies themselves are not supposed to limit um, uh, the extent of their authorization. Uh, then, of course, you have the executive branch. The White House is kind of cut out of much of this, especially, again, the Consumer Bureau. Uh, the, um, the Bureau Director is independent of the White House, mo removable only by cause, independent of uh, the Fed that funds it, uh, and, of course, beyond review uh, by... Uh, by, basically by the courts or the, or the Congress. Uh, the court review uh, involved here is, is, is a, a, I think, somewhat unusual provision where the courts require deference to be granted to uh, the bureau director as though she, uh, or he or she, uh, were the uh, agency in charge of the particular statute in the first instance. And there are 18 consumer statutes run by I don't know how many agencies she has the authority to rewrite all of the rules pursuant to anything she wants to do, and the courts must, courts must give it a deference. So um, there, there in, in some instances, is just no oversight at all. Um, for, a, for Title II, a takings, if, if that's what was claimed, there may be collateral review under the Tucker Act and the Court of Claims, but the damage to the financial system would have by then, uh, I think, already uh, been done. And then you add all this up with no real clear dividing lines uh, between the branches or the functions of the branches as they might operate with the Resolution Authority or with the Consumer Protection uh, Bureau or with the, uh, uh, um, or with the uh, Financial Stability Board, many with common members, common uh, goals, uh, you have what I worry about, which is a, a disappearance of the line between the government and, uh, and, and the so-called governed. Uh, the, a line gets dropped out of the paper where uh, the New York Times describes um, a um, meeting of uh, the government with, um, uh, with, with, the, with the Wall Street. Uh, the article says the most powerful exec executives in the banking industry did not uh, go to the government. The government came to them. And where the government, without any distinction between which branch of government, the government came to them in the nest a secret hideaway in the Willard Hotel. And um, my thought about this is, is that, you know, uh, the founders might have known about the Willard Hotel. Well, I'm not sure it was built then. But, um, uh, but they, they might have known about some uh, tavern uh, in Washington, D.C. at the time. But I don't think they would have approved of this kind of gathering in the nest. Um, and uh, uh, you worry about Adam Smith's warning that, uh, or observation that a government made up almost exclusively of merchants is one of the worst form of governments of all, um, and th th the obliteration of all these lines does pose the threat, seems to me, that you have the kind of risk of agency capture, of rent-seeking, of, uh, uh, of compromise that, um, that is, is to be avoided was the main reason for, for creating the separation of powers, dividing it up uh, to begin with to keep uh, the power down to the lowest possible, the exercise of power down to the lowest possible level. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, lawyers are going to do very well with this, and so I'm proud to be a lawyer. Okay, well, thank you, um, and I appreciate the invitation to speak to uh, the uh, Federalist Society. I've spoken a couple times at the National uh, Lawyers Convention uh, before. Um, and I always find it uh, a gratifying experience. It's always kind of intimidating because I come here as kind of the squishy, pragmatist, uh, uh, liberal centrist type. And then I, I, I'm here in a room with people, all of whom have greater moral clarity than myself. And <laughs> it, it's, a little bit like, it's a little bit like being a lion thrown into a den of Daniels. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I'm not here as a banking expert, surely, uh, but I do know a few things about the non-delegation doctrine, which I uh, was given to understand will be an important part of our discussion. And you have at your uh, tables a short clipping, um, which I wrote as, a, as chair of the Avalos section uh, 
uh, in 2001, immediately before turning the reins of the section over to Boyden. Uh, so we have worked closely together for a long time, um, uh, with pleasure. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, column, I spoke about the just decided American trucking case and offered a modest suggestion, uh, which was that the non-delegation doctrine be uh, uh, overruled entirely, uh, or as I guess I would now put it, uh, rendered uh, non-justiciable. Uh, and with that as, as the backdrop, um, I, I thought I would spend today uh, giving a few reasons why a conservative might be sympathetic to that point of view. Uh, let's start with the uh, text of the Constitution. I take it that that's what conservatives like to do. Um, and uh, it provides that uh, the uh, uh, legislative power is vested in the Congress. Uh, but it doesn't have to be read uh, as saying anything about delegation of legislative power. I, I refer here to uh, an article written a couple years ago by Eric Posner and Adrian Vermeule who are not usually uh, considered liberals. Um, and their argument was that the whole concept of a non-delegation doctrine is just a, a mistaken notion that somebody tried smuggling into the Constitution. It, it had a little uh, play in 1935, and uh, since then, people have come to understand that it just doesn't belong there. Uh, their argument is that the, uh, the exercise of uh, giving power to an agency isn't a delegation of legislative authority, it's a creation of legislative authority. Uh, excuse me, it's, it's an exercise of legislative authority by creating executive authority. Now, executive authority is going to be exercised by passing rules, deciding cases, um, and we don't think of that as something that is giving away the legislative power. It's, it's the kind of thing that the legislature was supposed to do under Article Two. The received wisdom of the non-delegation doctrine is that um, uh, such an exercise of power could be invalid if it does not have in it an intelligible principle to guide the agencies and the courts. Um, but you don't get that from the text. And so maybe it was just a mistake and the law has somehow been right for the last 70 years by not giving any force to the alleged um, uh, limitation on Congress's power. Now, I know you're thinking that that really is, is dodging the issue uh, of concentrating huge amounts of authority in uh, administrative hands and really too clever a notion to get away from the, uh, the real problem out there in the world. And, I, and of course, I, I don't think that that settles the question. I mean, we all know that constitutions should be understood and, and interpreted in light of modern realities and not just in terms of uh, what people thought in the 18th century. I mean, all sensible people understand that. So uh, let's think about it as a current uh, reality. Uh, the, the insuperable problem, it seems to me, with a, a judicially enforced non-delegation doctrine is the difficulty and I think impossibility of drawing the line uh, between what is permitted and what is not permitted. And the courts have repeatedly uh, said, we can't do that. Um, uh, th there's an article uh, recent, written not long ago by uh, John Manning at Harvard, also not usually considered a liberal, uh, in which he describes uh, the uh, potential for a, a robust non-delegation doctrine as, and I know it when I see it, kind of standard. And if I, if I can quote him just uh, briefly, he writes, when one asks a reviewing court to examine whether a legislature has adopted a sufficiently precise policy, the inquiry has an irreducibly arbitrary feel to it because there's no measure of how much precision such an actor should be expected to supply. In other words, courts can make a rough judgments about how precise a statute is. They have no basis for determining how precise it should be in order to satisfy the fairly abstract duty to make policy through a, a prescribed method. So, you know, one might think that, that conservatives would be nervous about a, an open-ended, subjective judicial test. Uh, this, at least a lot of times they seem not to think that's the, the right way to set up constitutional law. Um, to, uh, to, to uh, just leave, uh, and I know it when I see a test, to decide when there's too much power. Um, I think the courts, as they've tried to face questions of non-delegation and come to grips with whether they are capable of drawing these lines, have, have had to, to look at the difficulty of deciding uh, how much is too much, because you'd have to take into account 
um, the, the difficulty of the subject matter as, as well as the difficulty of reaching agreement about it. And I, I think financial regulation is probably a good example of that. Again, with the caveat that I'm not a banking law uh, expert, I think certain things jump out at you. This is a complicated matter. Uh, the, the aspects of the financial crisis that Congress undertook to deal with are, are many and varied. Uh, they did write 2,300 pages of legislation about it. I've, I've heard very few people argue that the law is, is too brief because they didn't go into enough detail, uh, but I suppose they could have written 6,400 pages instead. Um, but, you know, I think the courts recognize the reality. They have finite time to deal with the issue. It, uh, doing nothing seemed not a credible option in the context of the greatest uh, financial crisis since the, the Great Depression. Um, but in the, in the time they've got, perhaps the most that you could expect would be agreement on some things, only 2,300 pages worth of things, and then um, leaving some, some uh, language vague or open-ended and entrusting uh, an agency with the job of, coming up, of taking the first stab at, at filling in some of those gaps uh, with the understanding that uh, then there will be opportunities for oversight and, and reaction to it. That, I think uh, courts have understood that that's probably what they have to do. Um, and of course, we're talking here only in the context of Congress trying as hard as it can to get it right and all working together to produce our harmonious whole. Uh, the Congress we have, however, has other difficulties, especially these days. Uh, uh, if you have a, a Congress in which uh, there is uh, a 60 vote filibuster uh, rule in effect uh, at the Senate level. If you, um, here I'm taking off my scholarly gravitas and drifting toward my s s pundit uh, mode. Um, if you have uh, uh, a, a substantial uh, caucus that is trying not to work very hard uh, for the law and, and making some moves uh, to uh, undercut it or prevent it and only f uh, uh, three cross party lines, it gets even more difficult to write a coherent law. Because if you have to scrounge for every vote, you have to cater to the idiosyncrasies of every single person who's going to form your coalition. Because any one of them can bail out. And, and that is a formula for aggravating whatever problems you would otherwise have of, of trying to get a, 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 uh, a clear and a coherent, never mind moderate, uh, piece of legislation adopted. Um, and so, for, but you can leave that last part out as a gratuitous uh, slur. It's all right. You can even you can get back to the to the Congress that's all working harmoniously and amiably to produce the law, and you'd still have the problem of things that they cannot resolve. Uh, and I think the, the non-delegation doctrine is is administered in that light. Um, uh, you know, the serious point I want to make with you know stripped of badinage is that uh, I think you have to think about schemes of this kind as, um, as an unfolding story, something that unfolds by degrees. And the, the right way to think about uh, the enabling legislation is as the first stab, and then issues will arise. Uh, at that point, members of uh, Congress, the courts, the public will react against whatever solution the agency makes, and there will be uh, questions of how to limit the power that has been conferred. And I think really at that stage of the game, Boyden and I and uh, uh, everyone in between might come to some fair amount of agreement on what the problems are, what kinds of things look abusive, might have turned out not to work out very well and could reach uh, constructive solutions. Um, but I, I think when you look at the law at the, at, at the outset, uh, there's all the difference in the world between looking at it in a, in a positive light in terms of making it the best way it can be, analyzing it sensibly uh, to solve the problems and be fair to all persons, uh, basically the, the, you know, the mo approach to interpretation uh, that Justice Breyer recommends in his new book. And for those few of you who have not gone out and read it already, I'm sure you're going to want to do that. On the other hand, there's the approach of reading it as negatively as possible with a view towards uh, ditching it. And I, I, I do stand with the former approach, and to that extent, we might be in disagreement. Thank you. Thank you. Or perhaps another view, Peter? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I, actually, I would love to have taken on Ron's question uh, whether 
uh, doing nothing was a credible option. I assume we will get to that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, in fact, I think it was the most credible option. At least when Congress acts, they ought to know what they're doing and why they are doing it. And I don't think they'd had any studies to determine actually what caused the financial crisis. The one study that they did uh, require, uh, the one that I happen to be engaged in, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, is not to report until the middle of December. It might actually have to extend its it's reported to January because it's not ready yet, but Congress acted before finding out what actually caused the financial crisis. So I, I think it's a legitimate question whether Congress did anything responsible here at all, uh, quite apart from the fact that they were able to write 2,300 pages. But I will, I will now turn to the subject of what we're supposed to be talking about uh, today, and that is the constitutional implications. Now, I am, I guess, old-fashioned in the sense that I had always thought that the separation of powers was in the Constitution as the founder's way of protecting individuals against the power of the government. And the idea there, I thought, and maybe constitutional lawyers, of which I am not one, could tell me something else, but I thought the idea was that uh, if the legislative body and the executive were separated and in fact in some kind of adversity, it would be a little bit better uh, in protecting uh, the individuals, people, uh, and others within the United States against the power of the government. But if they are united, as was true in parliamentary systems at the time that our Constitution was developed, uh, the protection of the, of the people, of the individuals, was less. Uh, we tend now to focus, of course, on the Bill of Rights, which added to those, but we have to realize that, at least my limited understanding is that the founders originally adopted this structure as what they thought was going to be adequate for protecting individuals. So what I thought I would do is, is listening, having read what Boyden and John had done, an excellent piece of work that they have done, I would try to go through one element of this legislation, which I think does raise uh, very seriously this question of, uh, the, of whether Congress can delegate uh, unlimited amounts of power uh, to the executive branch and still stick within the constitutional limits or the structure of our Constitution, or however anyone would like to formulate it. Um, uh, so I'll focus only on the section that deals with uh, systemic firms, uh, systemically important companies. And, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what is authorized there, and at the end, you, we'll give you the facts and you decide who says that. Um, but that's the idea. We'll, I'll lay these things out and you can decide whether you think that this is, um, fits in with the constitutional scheme. Um, we start with something called the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is made up largely of all of the regulators um, and headed by, chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury. Important here, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, because, of course, Secretary of the Treasury is appointed by the President, reports directly to the President, one of the top officers of the executive branch. Um, the term systemically important, which is what we are dealing with here, firms that are, that is, financial firms that are systemically important, um, is defined in this way, and that is firms that could pose a threat to the financial stability of, uh, presumably, of the United States, either due to the potential of material financial distress or due to the company's ongoing activities. That's it. Um, now, there really isn't much content in those terms. It provides a huge amount of discretion to that body to determine whether a company is, in fact, a systemically important company. I might add as kind of a footnote that the statute is very specific in one respect, no doubt about the delegation here, and that is they say that any bank holding company of $50 billion or more is in fact uh, systemically important. 
no, no one questions that that is an appropriate, a proper delegation. So they could do it in one, at least one way. But then they go on to say, no, 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 in, in addition, any kind of financial firm, uh, we leave out the question of what is a financial firm, because I think that actually can have some content. But any kind of financial firm um, that might pose a danger to stability uh, because of when it gets into financial distress or um, because of its ongoing activities can be considered systemic. And what happens after that? Uh, and t what happens after that is those firms are turned over to regulation by the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, under those circumstances, is required to establish enhanced uh, standards for capital, leverage, liquidity, overall risk management requirements, and several other standards. And in, in the end, uh, uh, the Fed is told they may establish additional prudential standards that they might deem appropriate. The Fed can discriminate among the firms that it regulates based on their size, their capital structure, their riskiness, their complexity, their financial activities, and any other risk-related factors that the Fed considers appropriate. Um, with a finding by the Fed and the, and the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, that a firm poses grave risk, the Fed may take a number of additional actions, including terminating the firm, closing it down, even if it's profitable. So what does all this mean? Let's put it in the context of what it is actually doing. The Fed must do all of these things for these systemically important firms, which include banks, bank holding companies, as I mentioned before, insurers, insurance holding companies, securities firms, securities holding companies, finance companies, hedge, hedge funds, private equity, and any other kind of firm that might be considered financial and systemically important. Now, think about this. These firms are all competing. They are all in the same financial services market. They're competing with one another daily. We can leave out the policy question of whether that's a good idea for anyone to be regulating them um, and whether any particular institution could have the expertise to be able to sort out all the competitive questions that arise when all of these different business models are competing. But just talking about the constitutional questions and the question of delegation, what this means in effect is that the Fed is managing the entire financial system of the United States. Even though all these firms are competing, they can direct one firm or one industry to hold more capital than the market would otherwise require it to hold. They can require it to have less leverage than the market would ordinarily require it to hold. Now, every time they do something like that, that disadvantages that industry vis-a-vis -vis all the other industries that are all competing with that industry. So the Fed has the ability here to completely control who succeeds and who fails in the competition for the business of um, the consumer. So I think what this does, at least to me, is raise the question whether there is any content at all in the non-delegation authority, because I will raise this question and I'll ask Ron um, to answer it, not necessarily now, but at some point. And that is, if Congress simply said Instead of the, I guess it's almost 30 pages that they have, uh, well, it's actually several hundred pages that they have in the bill uh, defining uh, the, the activities uh, of the Fed in connection with these systemically important companies. If Congress had simply said one sentence, the Fed, the Federal Reserve shall manage competition in the financial services industry, period, full stop. Um, would that be an acceptable delegation of authority? And if we've come to that, 
I think we're in serious trouble. Thank you. Arthur, your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with you. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and say I think the constitutional issues surrounding the non-delegation doctrine have been you know, very well teed up. And I'd like to address a somewhat different question. It's certainly related to some of the things that, that Peter has said. Uh, the question is, for me, does the uh, Dodd-Frank Act actually accomplish the purposes that uh, were set out before Congress and that were announced as the reason why the act was passed? I'll just read two quotations. Uh, Federal Reserve Board Chairman Ben Bernanke said, if the crisis has a single lesson, it is that too, the too big to fail problem must be solved. Uh, President Obama said uh, upon signing the law, because of this law, the American people will never again be asked to foot the bill for Wall Street's mistakes. There will be no more taxpayer-funded bailouts, period. Um, well, I wish that that were true, but I think it's certainly not true. Uh, and the question is, you know, why wasn't the too big to fail problem solved? And I think that um, there were too big to fail problems on two sides of the ledger. Uh, uh, my colleague Peter has written in many places very eloquently that uh, Fannie and Freddie were an enormous too big to fail problem. Uh, they weren't even addressed in the statute. Um, the other part of the too big to fail problem were the enormous uh, complex financial institutions on Wall Street and elsewhere, uh, the giant financial institutions, I'll call them large complex financial institutions or systemically important financial institutions, the SIFIs. Um, in each case, what you had was a tremendous exploitation of public subsidies, both explicit and implicit, and uh, gross undercapitalization for the risks being taken uh, on both sides. Uh, Fannie Freddie on their side, uh, the, the, the SIFIs on their side. Um, so the question is, does this act solve those basic problems? And the, and the, and the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, uh, yes, there are supposed to be enhanced capital standards, but you, you have to rely upon the same regulators uh, who didn't uh, require enough capital in the first place. And uh, one thing that I, th I found very shocking, uh, uh, Peter was very much involved in the, in, uh, the uh, Federal Deposit uh, Insurance Corporation Improvement Act of 1991, which established something called prompt corrective action which meant that when you become undercapitalized, uh, the regulators are supposed to crunch down on you. Well, uh, essentially, the prompt corrective action was suspended explicitly for the top 19 firms. Uh, Chairman Bernanke said, we're not going to apply prompt corrective action to the top 19 firms. I mean, that, it's interesting that the, that, that the fiducia has no such discretion, uh, but they exercise it anyway. Um, so how can we uh, be sure that uh, capital will be required next time when it wasn't this time? What about the so-called no bailout? Uh, the, the whole purpose uh, is to set up this thing called an order, orderly liquidation authority, uh, which is supposed to uh, may, mean no more bailouts, that will put every SIFI into a, a hospital-type situation and, and break them up. Well, the problem is um, I'm, I'm not against the concept of an orderly resolution authority. I think that makes sense. But there are many loopholes left open. For example, uh, they still allow the Fed to make uh, broad-based liquidity programs available under its Section 13.3 authority. Well, one broad-based liquidity program that they used was the <laughs> primary dealer credit facility, which was addressed at the top 20 uh, financial institutions. There's no, no reason to stop them from using a primary, uh, uh, primary uh, dealer credit facility again. Uh, supposedly, it's only supposed to be made available to solvent institutions. But as you'll remember, when the TARP program was announced and capital infusions were made into the nine largest banks, uh, we were told, oh, these are all solvent institutions. They don't really need the capital. We're giving it to them anyway. Uh, within a month, they had to infuse significant amounts of more capital into Citigroup and Bank of America, which proved to be, unfortunately, not so solvent. So that's not much of a, 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 a restriction either. They did not repeal the systemic risk exception under the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Act. Um, the, the, the systemic risk exception was used to guarantee $300 billion of assets uh, against loss for Citigroup. It wrapped around the entire holding company, protected the shareholders as well as the creditors. Uh, that authority still exists. Uh, the FDIC still has $100 billion of borrowing authority from the Treasury for insurance purposes, uh, which is not limited to the deposit insurance fund. That can be used. Uh, so the, the FDIC can prefer certain classes of creditors over others. Uh, 
and they've already put out a notice of proposed rulemaking basically saying, well, we're certainly going to impose uh, haircuts on long-term bondholders, complete silence as, as to short-term creditors of one year or less, which I think is going to have the perverse effect of encouraging banks to load up with short-term hot money, more repos, more commercial paper, because long-term bondholders uh, are at least uh, facing some threat of haircuts, and the short-termers are not. One of the worst things is that the so-called orderly liquidation fund, which is supposed to pay for resolving these failures, is not funded. There's not a dime. Uh, there's no money in that. Uh, instead, the FDIC has to borrow from the Treasury to pay for the, for the resolution. Now, supposedly, yes, you can go back against the, the assets, maybe the creditors. Uh, you can make ex post assessments on SIFIs. Uh, but, but, but there certainly will be bridge loans from taxpayers. Uh, that makes no sense. We wouldn't operate, I don't think, with a deposit insurance fund with no money in the bank. We didn't have enough this time, but we, we at least had $50 billion. Uh, but to have no money in the bank and to not require SIFIs to pay assessments is crazy. It's like saying, well, hey, I've got, I've got a nice auto insurance policy. I won't pay any premiums until I crash the car. I mean, not many insurance companies would operate on that kind of a basis. Uh, and what that means is, so the SIFIs that fail uh, will have paid nothing into the fund while accumulating profits and distributing them before they crash, and only the ones who are more prudent and, and, and less risk-taking will be forced to pay anything afterwards. Um, and, and my, of course, the, the Drod Frank Act can't stop uh, Congress from passing a son of TARP the next time we have a systemic crisis, and if the regulators go to Congress and say, oh, no, no, you don't understand. We can't shut these things down. We have to prop them up. We have to do open bank assistance. Uh, and the trouble is, the more loopholes there are and the less you have any fund to deal with this situation, the more likely is that Congress can be panicked and railroaded into another uh, TARP-type uh, uh, bailout. Um, so the question is, how can we stop this? I mean, obviously, I, I totally agree with Peter. The, the first thing we better do in the new Congress is to address Fannie and Freddie. Uh, but it seems to me, in terms of the other SIFIs, the, the, the Wall Street and big bank SIFIs, uh, we've got to stop the subsidies that, are, that, that continue to flow to these institutions. How do you stop them? Well, one thing would be, yes, yeah, certainly to increase capital. But uh, that hasn't worked very well in the past. Uh, secondly, it seems to me that you actually start creating a meaningful, meaningful pre-funded orderly liquidation fund paid for by these institutions so that they actually think they might actually be put into the hospital because there's money to do it. Um, third, and most importantly, is to actually create some kind of meaningful separation between the banks and their non-bank affiliates, I mean, so that they cannot use deposit funding, which is the lowest cost funding. If you want to know how low cost it is, look at your bank statements. 0.05%, 0.01%, that's what you're getting on your, on your deposits. Uh, that's really low-cost funding, isn't it? You can't get cheaper funding than that. That funding is being used to fund the most speculative activities under existing rules. Uh, and of course, it, and, until you repeal a systemic risk exception, you can have more Citigroup asset guarantees. We can do a lot more, it seems to me, to stop the flow of subsidies across. If we don't, uh, the, the same encouragement toward larger and larger and more complex and fewer institutions will continue. Um, and so I wish I could tell you there won't be any more bailouts, period. I think we're far from that point. Thank you very much. Well, I think we start with a question that's already been put by Peter to uh, Ron. What if the uh, Federal Reserve, what if uh, Congress uh, enacted an act that said the Federal Reserve shall manage all financial firms, period. Does that, uh, does that cause any non-delegation problems? It, is it too, too broad? Probably broader than it should be, but narrower <laughs> than another act I can think of. I mean, our, uh, Boyden and I have a, uh, a colleague in the Ad Law section, Ed Grenier, who practices in the energy area, and, and uh, he, he tells the story of speaking with an, a FERC commissioner uh, who, who once said to him, you know, my problems really would be simpler if Congress would revise our statute to say, Section 1, it shall be illegal. Section 2, the Commission shall define it. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is a little narrower. Um, I guess on a policy level, I'd prefer something closer to what we have because it gives people a structure, it gives people something to frame their arguments around so that if there is um, 
debate and ultimately review. Uh, you have criteria to point to, and uh, my sense is that courts don't do that terrible a job with other uh, highly imprecise and vague mandates such as the public convenience, interest, and necessity. Um, uh, and so I would probably uh, prefer to have something more specific, but I think my argument is if Congress were to adopt that, I don't think I would say it's unconstitutional. Rather, I would say, one, they would never do it, and two, if they did it, they would decide they didn't like it and they would change it thereafter because something would happen that they wouldn't like. So I think just so that I can maintain some degree of consistency in my rhetorical position, I would say, uh, yes, that's constitutional, um, but uh, I, I'm not that worried about it. Go ahead. Well, I, I guess, again, I'm not anything like a constitutional lawyer, but um, I, I just have a question about whether there is then any separation between the executive branch and, and Congress. Well, yeah, because Congress adopted it, and it made the decision to uh, give such power to the executive branch. Now, um, I don't want to go into much constitutional law, but, but there is a distinction in separation of powers laws between where a branch grabs power for itself and where it gives it away. And where it grabs power for itself, the scrutiny is rather strict because that's highly suspect. But when they have the decisions that they're going to entrust that power to, to another branch where they could take it back, usually that uh, survives constitutional review more successfully, but not always. The, if those of you who know the line item veto case would uh, would recognize that there's a counterexample to that. But by and large, because we have separation from the very fact that Congress decided to give this money to the this uh, power to the executive, can oversee it, can rescind it if they don't like it, that ameliorates the separation of powers can difficulty. I, bef can I just ask one further question, Boyden, before you go? And, and that is simply if, con if, if Congress said the executive branch shall exercise all legislative power that the Congress was given by the Constitution, would that be okay? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's a very that's a very reasoned analysis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gordon, you had uh, the the question that Peter posed about managing competition is the language you use is strangely similar to the language that was uh, at issue in the Schechter Poultry case, uh, the National Recovery Act. Um, it worked then, but it didn't seem to bother anybody since, as Ron has pointed out. I, the point I was trying to make is, is, is to deal with Ron's backup, fallback, his plan B. Eh, yeah, we should be more precise. You know, but we got these, we got these backup. We got the courts and we got the Congress that can, that can check any overreach. But the point I was trying to make is Congress already thought about that when they did this, and they took all the power away from the courts. So the courts have virtually no ability to check anything here because they don't have the jurisdiction to do it. And the Congress doesn't either because in some instances, at least for the consumer, Board, the money comes from the Fed, doesn't come from the Congress, and the Congress is precluded from reviewing the money that comes from the Fed. Uh, and the courts don't have any uh, real, real hook to get into it. So there is, no, there is no check, and that's where I see the problem. It might not be called non-delegation if, if and when something like uh, pieces of this are, might possibly be thrown out. It, wouldn't be, it probably would be under the Article III, uh, that's the most prominent line of cases where uh, courts have thrown things out as a violation of Article III. So this wouldn't be a violation of Article One or Two; it would be a violation of Article Three. But somewhere, um, I think they're going to they're going to react to the overreach here and the lack, total, total, almost total lack of uh, democratic uh, uh, oversight. Uh, before we go on, uh, I want to let everybody know that because uh, Senator Elect Mike Lee will be speaking at uh, two o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to break up at. Uh, 10 minutes to two to give you a chance to get over there. But to follow up on something you said earlier, Boyden, um, would you flesh out the actual step-by-step -step process which uh, judicial review has in the district court when the FSOC votes by two-third majority and goes through that three-step process and decides to put uh, 
a non-financial, a non-bank financial firm into receivership, and what sort of protection does that um, firm have from, I know it's, it's impossible to conceive, but maybe arbitrary action by the administration? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the standard for Title I for, for being turned over to the Fed, uh, to, to the tender mercies of the Fed, is, is arbitrary and capricious. There's no in accordance with law, no constitutional uh, review. Um, and again, I, I, Brian and I can get into discussion about this. He's probably more current on this because he teaches this currently. I, I teach it only partly. I teach part-time at GDO. He teaches full-time. Um, but the cases that come to the D.C. Circuit primarily, some to the Ninth Circuit, some to other circuits, have to do, all of you are familiar with this, with, with a Chevron deference. You know, how do you interpret the statute? Chevron 1, Chevron 2, is it clear? If it's not clear, is the agency definition a plausible one? Blah, 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 blah. And, but that is statutory interpretation. Then there is also arbitrary and capricious review, which, to, for lack of a better way of describing it, it's, it's, it's State Farm about the, air, the, the airbag case where you look to see the, it's in the internal logic of the court's reasoning, of the agency's reasoning. But in, in this case, you can't tie that reasoning to, to the statute. And most cases that come up have to do with, all right, is it arbitrary or capricious in light of the statute? But in light of the statute, is irrelevant. Now, for the, for the seizure um, uh, in Title II, uh, the, the Resolution Authority, which uh, has been discussed really here, although I think that's the most egregious, uh, 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 you know, unilateral, arbitrary potential for action. Um, the trigger is whether, the key trigger is whether a, a, a failing firm is, Peter, a danger to the, poses a risk to the financial stability of the United States. That standard, which is supposed to govern whether or not the, 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 the entity can be seized, is, is taken away from the courts to review. They can't look at it. It's precluded by the statute. Bizarre, but there it is. And so I think that's a violation of Article Three if it's not a violation of the non-delegation doctrine. Well, how about the determination of whether the firm is actually close to default? Can well, that, that, be, that, 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 that can barely be reviewed. Uh, you, you have uh, under Title II, uh, the district court has to resolve the, the resolution issue within 24 hours. Can you imagine getting a district court judge up to speed in 24 hours? He certainly isn't going to get any sleep. Then the, the, the legislation provides that uh, the district court, or th th that there cannot be a stay of the seizure pending judicial review. Well, boy, that, that's, that's great. Uh, and then uh, if it's an unconsensual seizure, uh, it's secret. You know, it's, it's a star chamber proceeding, really literally a char star chamber proceeding. And if someone leaks what goes on behind closed doors, they're subject to, 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 to imprisonment. Can I? This is in the United States of America. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I respond? I, I'm trying to s say this is the United States of America. Uh, I'm pretty much on Boyden's wavelength on much of this. I mean, when I read the provision that says you, can, you have to have the decision in the district court uh, within 24 hours, I thought that is completely nutty. <laughs> and when I, uh, and if, if I take at face value the argument uh, and I see the statutory language that gives rise to the argument that the court can uh, only decide if it's arbitrary and capricious, uh, but not whether it's ultra virus or unconstitutional, that is also completely nutty and unacceptable and un-American. However, let me uh, try, to, try to stick up for our distinguished first branch of government. Um, because on further consideration, I think there are probably some arguments that one c can considered to offset the complete lunacy of what we've just heard about. Uh, on the 24-hour thing, uh, that did seem completely nuts, but then I read further in the section and, and looked at the way in which the matter is then appealable to the Court of Appeals. And it says the Court of Appeals shall expedite the appeal, but that's all it says. It doesn't put a time limit on there. I don't know. I, it's very hard. You can't get a, something out of this from the legislative history, and I certainly wasn't following uh, the, the, the inner details. But I would infer that what is contemplated here is that the district court decision is only a nominal step, and that the real action is expected to be in the Court of Appeals. And so the 24 hours uh, stop in the district court is probably just uh, there for some civil procedure reason.
uh, if they had just said you appeal to the Court of Appeals, uh, then, it, then people would say, okay, um, that's all right. Uh, according to the statute, the review in the Court of Appeals is whether the Secretary's determination was arbitrary or capricious. It's not reviewing the district court itself. So it looks, it may be the case, and I am speculating here, that the concept here is that for some reason they want uh, the district court to be the first po point of call, but then it goes to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. And there are many administrative decisions that are appealed directly to the Court of Appeals. And so we have this, uh, this, this stop by the district court for a way station. But if you take that view, then it doesn't seem quite as nutty as it would otherwise be. It's, it's just uh, a, a, a passing step, and then the real action begins. With regard to the standard review, um, yeah, it's totally, it's totally counterintuitive to say that you would review arbitrary capricious but not ultra-virus or constitutional. And there are many preclusion statutes that are read uh, aggressively or creatively to allow review of some issues, and it's normally exactly the opposite. Uh, that, of course, we'll review the constitutionality. Of course, we'll see if you're violating the statute. But as for the arbitrary capricious issue, we'll, that may be in the hands of the administrator. So I would suppose that court, I will predict that courts will not give it the interpretation that Boyden is giving it. I would predict uh, that uh, they would say, well, look, you can't even decide whether something is arbitrary and capricious as a reasoned interpretation, a reasonable interpretation of the statute without some concept of what you think the statute means. And so presumably Congress did not intend to bar us from considering the statutory issue here. I mean, one of the classic formulas of judicial review under the Arbitrary Capricious Clause is, has Congress considered the relevant factors and do they make a clear error of judgment? Well, relevant factors would be in the statute. You can easily work Arbitrary Capricious in to encompass um, statutory factors and I believe they would. It may not be the only way to read the language, but I think that is the clear pattern of the case law and in the American tradition, I think that's what they should do. And as for constitutional issues, the courts have made very clear that uh, only if Congress says in the clearest language uh, uh, that they want preclusion will they not hear constitutional issues. And if Congress does say in, in the clearest language that you can't review it, they'll do it anyway. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, look at the Guantanamo cases, for example. Uh, I think uh, I, I really agree with Boyden that uh, the, the, the vision that he puts forward is a fearsome one, but I would be more optimistic that we won't actually find ourselves there. If I could just make one quick, sorry. Uh, the, 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 the writers of the statute knew how to put in accordance with law and statute and constitution. And they knew how to invoke Title VII of, uh, Chapter 7 of Title V, which is just review. They knew all those things, but they also knew what arbitrary, so they, anyway. If the courts do say that must include statutory interpretation, then they've basically said there's a violation of Article Three here, and uh, that's why we're going to throw it out and rewrite it, which is fine with me. I will also point out, though, that the law is quite explicit in saying the appellate courts cannot review the question uh, of whether uh, the Treasury's determination uh, that the default would cause serious adverse effect on financial stability. That standard, which is the linchpin for, is, is specifically uh, 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 taken out of, this, of, of the review capacity. It's going to be very hard for a court to put that back in. I think it's a different issue entirely. I mean, that would go to the more substantive matter of whether it's appropriate for judicial review. And I would like to hear people who know more about banking uh, law than I do uh, go ahead, think about the wisdom I, I of that. I think that, you know, that where this came from, obviously, was bank receivership practice, that the idea that, that and, and this has been fought over in bank receivership, that you can put a bank in receivership ex parte, essentially, but then there has to be a post there has to be a post receivership hearing to, to handle the, the, the takings related issues and, and so there's post deprivation review. Uh, th now if you look at those cases they basically said well that kind of ex parte seizure under judicial control and then a post deprivation review in terms of whether it was wrongful whether there should be compensation uh, is based on the fact that the bank chose to be chartered uh, by a governmental authority and the bank chose to get FDIC insurance and so there was a trade-off of benefits for fewer rights. Now the question is now you're taking the bank receivership model and you're stretching it around the entire holding company and the holding company of course is... <coughs> 
Just the hedge fund with no connection right. to the government. And you're also searching around people who don't even own banks. But certainly the holding companies for banks and the non-bank people haven't been chartered by the government and didn't swap you know, less rights for, for uh, deposit insurance. So it'll be interesting to see whether that bank receivership model holds up quite as well uh, when it's not really a bank that you're talking about. Any other questions of the panel? Shall we throw it open to the public? Oh, by the way, uh, uh, one thing, Ronald, uh, the, uh, we had a similar situation in immigration law saying that we couldn't review any discretionary acts of, uh, of the uh, Attorney General as far as removability. And then the Real ID Act came along, the Real ID Act of 2005, and specifically exempted from our lack of reviewability <laughs> the issues of of statutory construction and constitutional rights. So that may be a, an amendment to suggest to this act, something like that. Uh, all right, now, there's a microphone over here, and we've opened up the session to people who'd like to ask questions. So would you, if you please go to the microphone and state your name and affiliation, and then your question. You can ask it of the panel as a whole or as to any member of the panel. Uh, my name is Alan Rawl. I'm a part of Sidley Austin. I find all of the discussion of the non-delegation doctrine particularly bracing and, and stimulating, perhaps even encouraging. But I do wonder whether we're barking up the wrong doctrine uh, or perhaps the wrong article of the Constitution. Uh, what about the appointments clause problems, maybe the take care uh, clause that the President has the responsibility to execute the laws? Now, there's a lot, of pro uh, a lot of power that has been discussed that's been delegated perhaps to the Secretary of the Treasury, but the CFPB that, that uh, Boyden mentioned, the Federal Reserve, these are uh, not under the President's uh, direction, and while there may be for cause removal authority, the fact of the matter is that the intent and the design is to take power and authority away from the President and uh, make it even uh, more, uh, Boyden has talked about the lack of judicial review, but there's also not uh, any kind of accountability really uh, by the President. And uh, any regulations that are issued by these independent authorities are not going to go to the White House, are not going to go to OIRA and the Office of Management and Budget from review. Uh, does that pose constitutional problems under the President's <coughs> Article II authority? And does it make any sense to take it out of the the control and influence and, and judgment of the, of the President, who is, after all, uh, supposed to be accountable? Well, I think, that yes, Alan, I think yes for the Director of the Consumer Bureau. That is a person who, who's not going to be under the control of the President or the Fed. Uh, and, um, and so I think there's a real, a real problem there. And uh, Peter, why don't you, you, uh, you pick up? There are actually several problems with that. You, you pointed out one of them, not under the control of the president, because appointed for a term, single person, appointed for a term, um, not under the control of the Fed. The, the statute has specific language that says the Fed cannot ha have anything to do, really, with what the uh, director of the CFPB does. But finally, and this is, to me, the most striking thing about it, they're not under the control of Congress either through the appropriation authority because they are given by statute 12, uh, 10% now, but then later 12% of the Fed's operating funds um, to use, which comes out to something now about $600 million a year. Um, now, let's remember what we have with the Fed. The Fed, first of, first of all, is independent of Congress and doesn't get any operating funds from Congress anyway for a good and sufficient reason, we think. That's been constitutionally challenged and, and upheld. Um, but now we're taking another institution and we're grafting that onto the Fed and giving them some of the appropriate appropriations that the Fed has for itself through its management of the of uh, monetary affairs. It doesn't get any buy or leave from Congress. But the important thing it seems to me to look at here is that the Fed at least independent as it is of all the branches in a very informal sense, not formally so, but informally independent of the branches, is at least made up of people who are appointed on a bipartisan basis in a collegial form, a commission-like form. Here we have a single person who is insulated from control from anyone. And in addition, and, and I guess this doesn't have constitutional implications, but it is uh, a, an amazing thing to me, 
if you look at the range and scope of this administrator's power, there is nothing that comes close to it in the government, even at the cabinet level. Nowhere. Because what this person is able to do is to regulate not only the largest banks, but regulate the check cashing firm on the street corner in any little town in the United States. And everything from the top to the bottom can be regulated by this single person and everything in between. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Can har I, I can hardly believe it can pass constitutional muster, but then again, there's also Ron, a, Ron can you let it happen. You mentioned OMB is also a little provision in there which says that OMB can't review the budget either, which is just a little, little dig, it was a <laughs> gratuitous dig. All right, another uh, question? Uh, can I speak to oh, that yes. one too? Just a second. Uh, Alan, I appreciate the question. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be a Federalist Society meeting without a debate on the unitary executive. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I say that fondly and not uh, in, a, in, a, in a snide way. Um, but now we, of course, have a new case. Uh, I, I'm sure that the, the, uh, the separation of powers junkies in the audience have, are aware of the Free Enterprise Fund case in which uh, the Supreme Court held that the uh, uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board was unconstitutionally constituted because it had what the court called a double layer of constitutional protection. That is, the, um, the uh, uh, PCAOB members could be removed only for cause by the SEC and the SEC members could, could, it was assumed, although apparently it's not true, but it was assumed uh, could be uh, removed by the president only for a cause. And the court says that is unconstitutional and we're going to sever the former of those provisions so that they're freely removable by the um, SEC and that'll fix it. In holding that that fixes it, the court has, without exactly coming out and said so, reaffirmed the Humphreys executor's case and reaffirmed that one level of removal protection is okay. Otherwise, you can't say, now it's fine. And so I think that although the debate is eternal, especially in these auspices, and it's not going to stop here, the latest word from the Supreme Court as of three months ago is that one level of Removal protection for cause is constitutional. Okay, second, we have, um, uh, what else do we have? The Appropriations Committee, okay, they, they are shut out of the action. Um, uh, I guess the, the, the nominal rules of Congress are that the Appropriations Committees are supposed to stay out of policy issues and uh, just look at, at wise spending of the money and the <laughs> like, and everybody knows that that isn't fully honored and appropriations committees do get into uh, those issues anyway. Um, but the idea that it's unconstitutional not to let them do so is, strikes me as a little um, unusual. Uh, so the fact that they chose to keep them out of this one seems to me um, uh, eyebrow raising, but, but probably not of constitutional dimension. And then the Fed can't control them? Okay. But I guess I'll, I'll know that there was a political compromise regarding the Consumer Protection Bureau and, and some people wanted a fully independent agency and some people thought that, was, that would be dangerous and so forth and it had to be within the Fed and so you came up with this very awkward compromise, which I think probably nobody thinks isn't awkward. Um, but if it would be constitutionally okay uh, to have it as just a garden variety independent agency, then this halfway house probably is okay too. Is it, is it really a legitimate constitutional argument to say that um, the, <laughs> the appropriations committees um, should not have any jurisdiction because, well, you know, they're just the appropriations committees? Uh, and Congress... Oh, but one Congress of, one has of, jurisdiction. They can change the authorizing statute. One, one of the powers that is given to Congress, I thought, again, in my old-fashioned way about the Constitution, one of the powers that was given to Congress as part of the whole separation of powers idea uh, was that they had the power of the purse. Right Now, that's maybe a little old-fashioned. Um, right, but they don't, the have, to the credit they don't have to exercise that power every time. And so I would go back to what I said before. Uh, they... they uh, um, forswore that power themselves. They could change the law and, and reassert it again. Uh, it's not a power grab 
it's the reverse, and generally separation of powers law is more tolerant of people letting others uh, do something than of seizing something that maybe you shouldn't have. If I can judge by that, I, I, I can't resist to point this out. In, in, in connect with what Ron said, there's a marvelous dissent by Breyer in which he points out that under the reasoning of the court's opinion, and I think this means what, what he says is, is describes the law, the SEC is not an independent agency. The SEC, I repeat, is not an independent agency. Why? Because it was chartered in the gap between Myers and Humphrey when it was illegal to establish an independent agency. So the only way you could argue congressional intent that it was to be independent was to argue that Congress intended to do something that was illegal. So it's a very interesting sidelight to all this. Uh, yes, no, it's, it's the, fascinating. The, the uh, next questioner has graciously allowed me to uh, make two follow-up points. Uh, Peter, on the appropriation, it's not merely a power of the purse, but the Constitution uh, prescribes that there shall be no expenditure, but except with, uh, pursuant to an appropriation by Congress. And on the, so really it's, a, it's an obligation to appropriate, although as, as Ron indicates, uh, Congress can do it in different ways, including perhaps a standing appropriation as, they, as they've done here. In the free enterprise case, uh, while I uh, you know, agree with that analysis that there seems to be a, a blessing of, uh, of Humphrey's executor, the court did also say that notwithstanding the willing relinquishment by the executive, of, uh, of his authority um, in the, uh, for the uh, Peekaboo uh, um, agency, that it was still the responsibility of the Supreme Court to adjudicate whether the executive gave away too much authority. Uh, in that case, they cured it perhaps a little too easily, but they did note that you can't willingly relinquish it if the Constitution wants you to hold it. Thanks. Next question. Kai Alberg, Port Angeles, Washington. Um, as was noted earlier, Congress chose to act before receiving the report investigating the causes of the crash. Uh, Peter Wallison and others have very lucidly pointed out some of those causes, in addition to Fannie and Freddie lying in the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, minimum percentage requirements of loans to low-income borrowers regardless of ability to pay, differential reserve requirements favoring residential mortgages, particularly if they were sold into collateralized mortgage pools and so forth. To what extent does this legislation, if at all, address these structural causes that have been identified, even if not formally reported to Congress, or are we likely to just have another bubble of exactly the same kind because the same forces will be at work again? That's a good question. Do you want to take that on, uh, Arthur? Or, uh, or Peter, you want to start? Actually, <laughs> um, I, I wrote that question. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Someone's been reading what I've, write, what I've written, um, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I think if, my view is that, that um, Congress did not at all address the real causes of the financial crisis. And again, when I say this, this is my view, not necessarily the view of the FCIC, which will have its report out in January. It may well be different from mine, um, but the, the, it, this is a really important fact about this legislation, it seems to me. I can't make it into a constitutional issue, however, but it is a really important fact that what I think can be demonstrated to have been the cause of the financial crisis, which is the U.S. government's housing policy, was not addressed at all in the legislation that was purportedly intended to deal with the financial crisis. Anybody else on that? I, I would just uh, uh, add, I, I think it the, the statute partially addressed some of the causes. There is a, 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 a title toward the end on, on mortgage products. I mean, clearly, when you when you allow mortgage mortgages to be made based on the teaser rate with no no concern about whether the borrower could pay the fully amortized rate, I mean, that is just a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, so certainly, um, there's an attempt. Whether the attempt will be successful or not, that's to be seen. But there's an attempt to uh, to get sounder mortgage lending. I mean, uh, certainly, I think if we've learned everything, anything, it is that sometimes it's better to rent than to give someone a mortgage that will essentially ensure uh, default and foreclosure. And that's essentially what we were doing. Um, as I suggest, and I won't repeat what I said, I think that to me, uh, what drove the crisis uh, um, uh, beyond bad lending, uh, but the bad lending came from uh, 
was was really run from, uh, funded by uh, these large, too big to fail institutions, either directly or indirectly. Fannie and Freddie on one side, and the big Wall Street firms and big banks that were competing with Fannie and Freddie on the other side. And we, you know, you had not enough capital, or you had all kinds of, of subsidy problems and moral hazard problems. And as I've indicated, I don't think we've even begun to deal uh, with the too big to fail problem and the, and the, and the uh, uh, subsidy problems. Um, so uh, I think it's a, at best a, a very partial and inadequate response in those areas. Uh, just let me fill in a little bit on this to get into a little bit more detail. There are 27 million subprime and alt A loans outstanding in, in our financial system. That's about half of all mortgages. Those are very weak mortgages and, and failed when the bubble started to deflate. 19 million of that 27 million were the f responsibility of the government through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, or FHA, and uh, the banks that were required to make these loans under the Community Reinvestment Act. So were those issues dealt with in this legislation? The answer is no. Arthur is correct that there is something in the bill that provides for a qualified residential mortgage uh, to be defined by the regulators and to the extent that that is uh, done, then the private sector could securitize mortgages um, that are of a certain quality, high quality presumably. Um, if they don't create a qualified residential mortgage, if there isn't one um, that is being securitized, then they, the private sector has to uh, have a retainage of 5% for each mortgage that it securitizes in order to give them, quote, skin in the game. But the point is that over two-thirds of all mortgages that were made up to the time of the financial crisis, the crash, uh, were made at the instance of and bought by and responsibility of the U.S. government. And when Congress in the Dodd-Frank Act came to legislate on this, they didn't deal with it. And in fact, they exempted FHA from the requirements of this qualified um, residential mortgage, which means that FHA can continue to make crummy mortgages for which the U.S. taxpayer will ultimately be responsible. On the issue of whether the Dodd-Frank bill zeroed in and uh, on the causes of the financial crisis, you might uh, study Section 342 uh, of the Dodd-Frank Bill, which requires all the new agencies created and the firms which will be regulated by the agencies to adopt affirmative action programs regarding hires. <laughs> Um, next question. Uh, well, my name is Bonnie Wachtel. That was a brilliant lead into my question because I was also going to build on Peter Wallison's writings, which are available to anyone to read at American Enterprise Institute about the government uh, hand in the, in the crisis. And I'll also add that you'd been warning about Freddie and Fannie years prior. So since you're so prescient, uh, it forms this question. I build a little bit on a, what a speaker was asking at one of the panels yesterday, which is the so what question. You know, as we both know, the Fed is enormously uh, important and powerful right now. They forced Bank of America to buy Merrill Lynch, and they told Citi they couldn't buy Wells and long-term capital. I mean, they're stage managing all of this stuff, as I see behind the scenes. I personally think they're doing a pretty good job, although others could disagree. But your comments, I mean, you made a number of lawyerly comments about what might happen in the face of this legislation and the big grant. But I'm, a little, I'm interested in focusing in on your thinking about, is there something in particular that you think will happen? Not what they might do, but what, is there something that you think they're likely to do that would be a misjudgment or something we should be concerned about? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, can, I can do that. Um, actually, uh, uh, what worries me most of all about the Fed's power, the, and, and I, I outlined in my remarks what enormous power they have over all of these very large institutions. And the thing that bothers me about this and worries me, having in my practice practiced uh, uh, before the Fed, for bank holding companies, I could see the enormous power uh, 
that they have over the decisions that are made by these bank holding companies. And you would say to your client, well, wait a minute, they don't have the power to stop you from doing this, or they don't have the power to compel you to do it. And the client would say, yeah, but they're our regulator. And that was the, that was the end of it. Um, we're not going to take them to court, and we're not going to refuse to comply with what they require us to do. So what we have here, and what I think will happen, this is a prediction, <laughs> is that we are going to create a partnership between the government in the form of the Fed and the major financial institutions in this country so that they will not be competing so much with one another as turning to the Fed and asking, by your leave, can I go into this business or that business? Can I um, uh, enter uh, 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 lending on the West Coast where I will be competing with uh, Bank of America, or do I have to stay here on the East Coast? That kind of thing will happen because the Fed will have the ultimate control over all these institutions, and this is scary. Yeah, but they on, today they only have the power, literally the power to regulate bank holding companies and some banks. In the future, they will have the power to regulate banks, bank holding companies, insurance companies, insurance holding companies, securities firms, finance companies, hedge funds, you name it. If it is a large financial institution, they will be able to regulate it and, and provide for everything that, that is at the heart of the businesses of those companies, including their activities, because if the Fed regards their activity as too risky for them, the Fed can terminate that activity. So it is, this is a remarkable grant of power and ultimately turns those companies into tools of the Fed. And that's why I've always called this act Obamacare for the financial industry. I, I would add to this if I, yes, it's, it's Obamacare. <laughs> I would add that, that you don't have to be big to be covered, and there was an article in the Financial Times two or three days ago about this whole thing and about the big banks trying to figure out, and all the institutions trying to figure out who's going to get caught in the net, and uh, hedge and equity funds figuring out how can they escape the net since they have no governmental you know, deposit insurance or Fed window or any connection. And then they quote from a, a banker, not by name, fearing competition, the banker said, quote, uh, as many more financial institutions as can be brought under the net, the happier we are. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Rockett, uh, former chair of the Financial Services Group here at the Federal Society. Question for the panel, which is the, the uh, creation of the Consumer Protection Bureau uh, uh, already has uh, some apparent flaws, uh, perhaps constitutional flaws. But the administration chose to uh, perhaps exacerbate those issues by instead of appointing the person who now leads it as the director, which is clearly required under the act, uh, um, creating a czar to run it. And um, my question for the panel is this. Uh, what type of additional legal challenges could be expected for the Consumer Protection Bureau, given the fact that she's already creating an infrastructure and putting together things that the director was required to do. Well, if she, if she actually starts to engage in rulemaking, which I'm sure she's going to do, uh, that I think, Ron, help me out here, that I think would really be a violation of, uh, of the vacancies clause. I mean, I, she, she was not confirmed by the United States Senate to the job that the statute does, at least in this instance, require congressional uh, um, and so she's been given a special assistant. She's not even the, quote, director, close quote. So she would be acting without authority if she started issuing rules. Now, exactly what theory, appointments clause, uh, vacancies clause, uh, lack of confirmation, lack of da-da-da, I, I, I think there's a real problem if she starts to do anything substantive. I guess I agree on the substance, but I think it would probably be decided on a more mundane level. It would just be a question of the scope of her authority. Uh, there are certain things that only the director can do under the statute. And if she did some of those things, that would probably occasion legal challenge. But I can't believe that this isn't being uh, thought about carefully. They came up with this very uh, tortured compromise to not appoint her the director, which 
apparently is a concession, but also to involve her in the planning process in ways that do not implicate legal rights and therefore trigger these um, uh, potential challenges. But you could envision um, perhaps crossing that line uh, either inadvertently or more likely uh, just daring to do it and think they'll get away with it in a particular case. But I think it would probably be just a straightforward uh, question of authority under the statute rather than the uh, the larger constitutional issues dominating it. They might lurk in the background to be sure. Well, we're getting you just about time to close, but I did want to leave you with this um, observation. Um, with all the heavyweight legal talent that we have, not only here on the panel, but in the room, um, I did a Google search last week, and I found that the constitutionality of the Dodd-Frank bill has been challenged exactly once so far in a lawsuit in Knoxville, Tennessee, by a bank that says that the setting of debit fee charges by under the act is unconstitutional. So all of these questions uh, um, I still have to be sued on. And with that, <laughs> we'll leave you and go see. <laughs>